Dr. Lalonde is Professor of Surgery at the Dalhousie University at St. John's, Canada. He also serves as the American Society of Surgery and Health Council Outreach and International Relations Director. He's been the past president of the Canadian Society of Surgery of Hand, past chairman of the American Board of Plastic Surgery, past president of the Canadian Society of Plastic Surgeons. He's an honorary member of the American Society of Hand Therapy. He has written over 100 international papers and 30 book chapters. He's also the editor of Wide Awake Hand Surgery Book. Over to you, Prof. Thank you. There we go. It's an honor and a privilege to be speaking to you today. Uh, is it working okay? Yes, Prof. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> I just, uh, there is a wide awake hand surgery book, and as Costas mentioned, the wallant.surgery website that's managed by Alistair Phillips. I don't make any money on either of these things, but they are very good. Uh, sources of information. <clears throat> this is a patient who's having a tendon transfer under Wallant. And with Wallant, we only use lidocaine and epinephrine. There's no sedation, no tourniquet. And we're going to transfer palmaris longus to EPL and FCU to EDC. What you're seeing there is tumescent local anesthesia. Tumescent local anesthesia means enough local anesthesia that you can see it everywhere you're going to cut. So I draw my lines where I need to have tumescent local anesthesia. And in this case, we inject 120 milliliters of one quarter percent lidocaine with one in 400,000 epinephrine, which lets you operate for at least three hours and do everything you need to do. Excuse me, sorry, I'm gonna go back to that case. Please forgive me, there we go. So after we inject that local anesthesia, uh, we get extensor pollicis longus and palmaris longus and we suture those. And the beauty of doing these awake is that you can measure excursion you can see if your tendon transfer is too tight or too loose. Here we are uh, taking FCU dorsally to weave into EDC. And this was a tough case because he had had a proximal forearm injury and we didn't know how strong his muscles were. So testing... Just try to straighten out your fingers as best you can. And you're maced? Okay, now yeah. try, try, try to lift up your thumb. Awesome. Nice. Oh my God. <laughs> One. Okay, lift up your thumb again. Beautiful. What are you thinking when you lift up your thumb? It's been so long. <laughs> no, but seriously, are you thinking move your wrist or are you thinking move your thumb? Move my thumb. Totally cool. <laughs> it doesn't feel like my hand. <laughs> okay, and make a fist. And lift out your thumb, straighten out your fingers. <laughs> for a human being to be able to see his thumb and his fingers extend for the first time in two years, and he didn't have to learn that tendon transfer, he just did it. Uh, it really has improved the results of tendon transfers. Those of you who have not tried a tendon transfer under wall ant should consider doing that. Uh, in spaghetti wrists, here we injected 90 milliliters of 0.5% lidocaine with one in 200,000 epinephrine. Sometimes, especially with table saws, it's hard to know which tendon belongs to which. And so if you ask the patient which tendon you're pulling on when you pull on the muscle belly proximally, they can tell you which tendon you're pulling on because they're awake. So if you pull on the long finger tendon and they say, oh, that's my long finger. Or uh, the other thing you can do is ask them to flex their long finger and the long finger tendons flex more. So it's much easier to put the tendons together in a spaghetti wrist when patients are awake. This patient 
uh, is going to have a tenolysis with no tourniquet, so very comfortable. There's no rush to do it. And she's 68 years old. Uh, when she was eight years old, she cut her tendons to her long finger. And so she's been unable to flex any more than this for the last uh, 60 years. So I want you to listen. I want you to listen. You're going to hear her crack. She's going to rupture her own adhesions. I've done a little bit of dissection. Now she's going to rupture the rest of the adhesions. You're going to hear like a snap, crackle, pop. Really hard. Keep pulling. Keep pulling. Ooh, that was good. I can feel creaking in my wrist. Yeah. Keep going. Pull, pull, pull. And straighten. And do it again. Straighten. And do it again. And do it again. Pretty cool, eh? Wow. Thank you for helping. Well, thank you. Yeah, no, it's great. It's great. And this patient, I don't know if you heard her say it, but she said, I feel creaking in my wrist. You know, this happens a lot. The adhesions are not where we think they are. And we do a little dissection, we ask them to pull, we do a little more dissection, we ask them to pull, and they're able to pop their own adhesions. You heard them at the beginning. Uh, for cubital tunnel release, if you don't have a tourniquet and you don't have the anesthesiologist at the head of the table, this is a very comfortable position to do an ulnar nerve release. And I use 60 milliliters of lidocaine with one in 200,000 epinephrine. And you can see the tumescence. Tumescence means swollen, visible, palpable local anesthesia at least two centimeters beyond wherever you're going to dissect. Some people who've never used tumescent local anesthesia get nervous about too much volume. This is not a problem. After you've done it a few times, you get it. And so I want you to look at this case. You'll see the bleeding is good even without a tourniquet. I close the wound with absorbable sutures. I never have sutures to take out with these or carpal tunnels. This is a different patient, but I want you to watch his face. He looks very comfortable, right? That's because he is. But watch him bring his shoulder down because he is a very sore shoulder ah, in that abducted position. If I had done him in the traditional manner with a tourniquet and sedation or a sleep, we would have had that shoulder out. He would have had a major painful shoulder and he would have woken up and said, Dr. Lalonde, my elbow doesn't hurt. What did you do to my shoulder? But because he was awake, you can put him in any position you like, which is comfortable for the shoulder. You're not making him comatose and damaging the shoulder further. So you can do these cases like this. You can do them prone. You can do them on their side because there's no intubation, intravenous, any of that stuff in the way when they're wide awake. All they get is lidocaine with adrenaline, like at the dentist. It's also safer in some cases. So this gentleman, uh, is a man who's dying of lung cancer. He died six months after. Uh, and his daughter sent me a great thank you card because for the last six months of his life, he was able to sleep. He couldn't sleep because his carpal tunnel was keeping him awake all the time. And you can see that he's on oxygen. The anesthesiologists properly did not want to put this guy to sleep. You shouldn't put people to sleep when they can't barely breathe when they're awake. And blocks are great when they work, but they don't always work. And plan B for a block is asleep or sedated. And so in this particular case, we actually did his surgery sitting up with him on his oxygen very safely, just like he'd gone to have a filling at a dentist. Now I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Pradeep Joshi. He's an anesthesiologist in England who specializes in upper limb blocks. He's a hand anesthetist. And he's been using Wallant regularly. And he loves to use it in high comorbidity patients. I'll let him tell you. 
rather than just having plan A and plan B, I'm able to have plan C and plan W. Plan well, they're extremely at high risk where they can't have a general anaesthetic, they can't have a uh, regional anaesthetic, and they need something which I know is going to work and is going to be safe for them. So I think it really has help me in, in those sort of circumstances where I think well, I can't do plan A, can't do plan B, and then you have to do one. So it's, it's made a big difference to my confidence in where I can apply the Wallen technique, the use of the local anesthetic, the confidence of knowing that actually this technique really does work. So for anesthesiologists who've actually tried it, it's another alternative. And it's something to consider because most serious complications of hand surgery are actually serious complications of sedation. Uh, pulmonary embolism, overnight admission because of nausea and vomiting, urinary retention, malignant hyperthermia, aspiration pneumonia, these are not complications of surgery. These are complications of sedation. And the latest is because of COVID, COVID droplets containing the virus after extubation, that danger is gone. And also the danger of having large teams working side by side in the operating room is gone because you can do this with one nurse and one patient in a room. In April, at the beginning of April, the British Society for Surgery of the Hand, the British Orthopedic Association, and the Orthopedic Trauma Society of England all encouraged their members to use Wallant to decrease aerosol contamination and decrease the risk of COVID transmission. Also, there's pretty good evidence that COVID uh, increases the mortality rate of general anesthesia, even above and beyond the COVID uh, mortality rate, which is already too high. So 50 milliliters of 1% lidocaine with 1 in 100,000 epinephrine is extremely safe. That's seven milligrams per kilogram we know in the plastic surgery literature, we can actually use 35 milligrams per kilogram and get safe blood levels. But if we stick with 50 milliliters of 1% with one in 100,000, that's extremely safe. And you just remember that number because if you need more volume, you just add saline. So if I need 200 milliliters of volume, to do a forearm tendon transfer like what I've shown you, I just add 100 to 200 milliliters of saline to my 50 cc's of safe base of 1% lidocaine. And then I can have as much as what I need. And one quarter percent with one in 400,000 is totally effective. You don't need more than that. And don't be afraid of big volume, low concentration, local anesthesia. Always have at least one to two centimeters of visible or palpable local beyond where you're going to dissect. It's like an extravascular beer block. If I put 40 cc's right there, where is it going to go? Everywhere. And that's perfect. And if you do this on both sides, you can do a proximal row carpectomy like this slide from Carlos de Pina from Portugal. And he actually even did a bone graft uh, on the um, uh, capitate when he saw where the capitate was rubbing and needed a, a, sorry, a cartilage graft where he saw that the capitate was raw and rubbing. So these subtle things that you see with movement uh, are very helpful. Now, when you inject the local anesthesia, you want patients to think you are a magician, not a torturer. And in 2020, you can and should achieve zero pain for injection of local anesthesia and zero pain of the surgery, other than a tiny little needle poke at the beginning. And these 13 rules of local anesthesia injection that should not hurt in 2020. I don't have time to go into in this, 
but they're in chapter five of the book. There's papers written on this. If you go to wallant.surgery website, there's all kinds of videos there. And I'm just gonna read them off, but you should take a screenshot of this. And there's a video for each one of these that exists. So use small needles instead of big needles. Don't blast the local in quickly. Slow down a little bit. Buffer the acidic local with bicarbonate. Insert the needle perpendicular to the skin. Don't inject in the dermis. Use sensory noise for needle insertion. Blow in at least two milliliters before moving the needle at all. Never advance sharp needle tips anywhere that's not numb and always inject anti-grade. Only reinsert needles in numb skin. Always inject too much volume instead of not enough volume. Ask the patients to score you every time so you get better and better. Use filler cannulas for big areas and always inject from proximal to distal because that's how the nerves run. And I'll only do the first one. You know, I see a lot of people injecting with giant needles. Every hospital has someone who orders needles. Go find that person. If her name is Maria, say, Maria, if you look at your order form, right over here, there's 27 and 30 gauge needles. Could you please order me some of these? They hurt a lot less. And if I was injecting local anesthesia into your son, wouldn't you like me to use a small needle that hurts less? I pretty much use 27 gauge needles as my go-to needle, but in the palm and in fingers, I like a 30 gauge needle that's half inch long with a 3cc syringe, especially in children and in patients who are particularly sensitive. For people who are afraid of needles, they get a, they get a 20 gauge needle to start their IV and another 20 gauge needle to have blood tests before sedation if they have a general anesthetic. I'd like to focus a little bit on flexor tendons now because if you are not doing your flexor tendons with Wallant in 2020, you really should be because the results are so much better. And most people who are following Jinbo Tang's recipes are consistently getting no rupture and almost no tenolysis uh, with wide awake repairs and adequate pulley venting today. The results should not be lousy anymore. They were lousy in the beginning of my practice. So this is a patient who's had her A4 vented and you see her on the table during the surgery and there's no clinically significant bowstringing, and there's no clinically significant bowstringing after the surgery. So you can vent A4. This is, sorry, let's go back for a sec. This is a case of A2 pulley venting from Julian Escobar of Colombia. You can see that his tendons are catching on the A2 pulley, which you can see easily in patients who are wide awake. And so he goes on and vents the proximal half of his A2 pulley until there's no more venting. He just vents a little more and a little more until there's no more catching of the tendons. And here's the same patient at three weeks with true active movement and at uh, three, uh, one year post-op. And so that's the venting the proximal half of the A2 pulley. This paper by Dr. Maria in the European Journal in 2016 was very important. He had seven cases of complete A2 pulley venting, 33 cases of partial A2 pulley venting, and not one case of clinically significant bowstringing. So forget the old don't vent A2 or A4 rule. And wide awake uh, uh, hand surgery has helped us prove this. The new rule today is never vent more than up to one and a half to two centimeters of total pulley venting to avoid clinically significant bowstringing. 
Complete preservation of the entire A2 and A4 pulleys gave us 50 years of unnecessary rupture and tenolysis. And so today, what we do is incrementally, judiciously vent pulleys. And that is safe, and I'm going to show you how to do that. So here you see me dividing the A4 pulley, cutting it or venting it. I do my first core suture, and then I test the repair with active movement. And I see that there's a little more cruciate pulley that I need to divide in this case. But I don't need to divide A3 in this case because the wide awake patient shows me what I need to divide and what I don't. So after venting A4, there's no clinically significant bowstringing on the table, and there's no clinically significant bowstringing at three months after surgery. Today, a good repair is 10 to 30% bulky with at least four strands that easily fit through up to one and a half to two centimeters of vented pulley. I used to think that the repair on the left, which is now what I call a grandma kiss repair, it's like when you kiss your grandmother on the cheek, the two ends of the tendon are barely touching. The problem, I used to think that's a good repair, and I'm embarrassed to say that I actually published this image on the left. A good repair today, which is in Jin Bo Tang's 2017 clinics paper, is a bulky repair. Why? I'm going to show you. I used to think the grandma kiss was a good repair because I needed to fit through the A2 and the A4 pulleys. Now I know I don't have to do that. So here's a patient that I've just repaired FPL. She's prone, wide awake. Now we're going to test the repair. This is a grandma kiss repair and look at it. It's, it's barely kissing. Now she tests it. You see the gap form? The gap is forming because I thought my repair was tight enough and it wasn't. And this in the old days would have gone on to rupture. And if you're still doing your patients asleep or with a motor block, you're still getting unnecessary ruptures because you're not testing your repair. In her case, I redid the repair, got a good solid repair, and she did not rupture because I did her awake. So wide awake, full fist flexion and extension testing allows you to repair gaps to avoid those unnecessary ruptures that you're now getting if you're doing them asleep or with a motor block. And it, in, it allows you to vent pulleys incrementally so that you don't have to come back and do tenolysis. If your repair doesn't fit through the pulleys today, it's not going to fit through the pulleys in three months and you will have to come back and do a tenolysis. And also wide awake repairs have taught us a lot about therapy. And now we no longer use Kleinart rubber bands and we no longer use full fist place and hold. We use up to half a fist of true active movement, just as you see in the gentleman in the middle, who's also the same guy that you see on the left and the right. And just follow Jin Bo Tang's post-op regime in his 2017 clinics paper, or you can Google the St. John Flexor Tendon Rehab paper, or you can go to wallant.surgery to find those regimes. So let me explain the theory of the movement that we're gonna do when Amanda starts you moving on Friday. The goal is to move it just a little bit so it doesn't get stuck, but not to move it too much so that it rips apart. It doesn't take much to rip this apart because the stitches are only about one-tenth as strong as your tendon. You're not going to use it at all. You're just going to move it just enough to keep it moving so it doesn't get stuck. What's the most important rule when we get you to start moving it? I can move it, but I can't use it. Pardon rule when you start moving it on Friday? I can move it, but I can't use it. 
You know, the single most important person in the room is the patient. It's not the nurses. You don't want to sit around and talk to them. And when somebody has a flexor tendon laceration, his life has changed if he wants a good result. And so I educate the patient. I have two hours to tell him exactly what to do. Keep his hand up. He, can't, he can move it, but he can't use it. For the first two or three days, his hand is on strike. He's not going to do anything until I see him with the hand therapist in four days. And at that time, he's going to start using his hand or moving his hand just a little bit. And he's going to follow pain guided healing. And my favorite question during the repair is, so what were you planning to do this week? Oh, you were going to go skiing? Uh, I don't think so. Let me explain to you why that's not a good idea. So much better than when they wake up from sedation or general anesthesia and go skiing. So in summary, the seven most important things to consistently get good results with clean cut flexor tendon repairs are at least a four strand, very solid repair with one centimeter bites that's bulky 10 to 30% judiciously venting up to one and a half to two centimeters of pulley, wallant intraoperative full fist flexion and extension testing, as well as the most important part, which is intraoperative patient education, up to half a fist of true active movement post-op, and relative motion flexion and extension splints I will talk about in just a minute. I want to end the cases with this last case of a man who cut all his finger flexors six months before I met him in Honduras. We injected 110 milliliters of quarter percent with one in 400,000. Then we harvested all four of his FDS tendons as grafts, and we dug A2 out of the scar in all four fingers. I think that hunter rods may be obsolete because you can dig out the A2 if you stay right on the bone and lift it up like a little uh, tunnel. So we passed FDS through the original A2 pulleys, and our first attempt wasn't tight enough for the tendon graft. And our second attempt, we got it tight enough because the patient was awake. And at the end of the case, we got all four fingers to bend flex beautifully. I apologize for a little bit of blood on the uh, patient because uh, we were starting to run out of local anesthesia at four hours. He was starting to get sore, but at three and a half, hour, uh, three and a half months uh, with WhatsApp um, uh, patient interaction with me from Canada to Honduras, there's the result that we got. Uh, in extensor tendons uh, and in flexor tendons, if you ask the patient to flex, the extensors relax. If you ask the patient to extend, the flexors relax. This is a uh, spinal cord reflex. And so here we're repairing an extensor tendon and the patient was having a hard time relaxing. So we ask him to flex and his extensors relax. This is a patient who has his extensor tendon repaired. Uh, this is simulating what's called a relative motion extension splint. And we put the patients in a splint that looks just like that. And they can actually start to use their hand at five days after surgery. And the reason they can use it at five days after surgery is because all of the tension is off with the relative motion extension splint. And we also decrease the excursion in that uh, finger. And this man went back to work 16 days after his injury, uh, working on a fishing boat. And this actually shows that you can measure the decreased excursion in a relative motion extension splint when a patient is awake on the table. And so if you have not started using these relative motion extension splints with your extensor tendon repairs, you really should. And there's a lovely paper that explains all this with videos. 
in the journal Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery that we just published that just came out a couple of months ago. At the count of three, you're going to feel a little poke, and I'm going to ask you to try to not move, okay? okay. One, two, little poke. That was the worst of it. And, and I really hate needles, just despise them. This needle was nothing, absolutely nothing. Kind of pressed on my hand three times, and then he put the needle in, and it wasn't uncomfortable. And then in a few seconds, it, it all went away. I felt the first poke, it was not painful. Not, not, not even a twinge, not, no discomfort whatsoever. No discomfort whatsoever. There's a tiny, tiny prick, which is not even worth mentioning. I didn't need to have any blood tests done. I didn't need to have the chest x-ray done. No tests. Well, I did not have to go in for tests. Um, as opposed to going, waiting in line and having tests and then going back another day for surgery, I had to do none of that. Why anybody would want to go into a hospital and, and, and actually subject themselves to a pilot test and everything for no reason just makes no sense to me. I had my own clothes on and I knew to wear a blouse that we could just roll the sleeve up a bit. I didn't need intravenous. I had no tourniquet on my arm. I ate before the surgery. I ate directly after the surgery. Like I said, I was not nauseated whatsoever. Uh, zero pain uh, before, during, and after the surgery. That oh. was fantastic. It takes an hour and 15 minutes to do, uh, and then you're back to your daily routine afterwards. I suppose the whole time I could have been here would have been maybe an hour at the most. I mean, I, I, I don't want an anesthetic unless I have to have it. Well, because it's the anesthetic that gives you the problems uh, in the recovery period, more, much more so than whatever it is you had the operation for. For one thing, when you're out, you're, you're out. You have the wake-up period. A lot of people are sick. They, and then, you know, then the, the drugs that they give you to stop you from being sick and for the pain and all the rest of it, there was none of that. And I have a, a few uh, medical conditions and I am on medication. Nothing changed. I found it very informative and very comforting that I was able to speak to the surgeon, to have him tell me what I should do, what I should not do afterward. It gave me all that information and I could hyper-focus on that information at the time because I wasn't doing anything else. My questions were answered while I was there. So I paid strict attention, took it to heart, did exactly what I was supposed to do. And I was amazed at how well it turned out. If you're interested in more of this type of information, uh, another place to search is YouTube, Lalonde Pulvertaft. There's a few lectures there about how to get less stiffness with finger fractures, how to inject so it doesn't hurt, uh, and more on tendon surgery. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, it was a fantastic lecture as usual. Uh, we'll keep the questions at the end of the session and I think our next speaker is getting ready.